So what we're talking about today is, is sampling and I'm gonna get into it. So what is a sampler? Uh, different people kind of understand sampling to be different things, but essentially what a sampler is, is a device that allows you to record audio and then assign it to keys or pads for musical playback. So a lot of people kind of think of Ableton Live as like a sampling DAW, and it really is, and you can do like loops and stuff in Pro Tools, Logic, all the different DAWs, uh, but what separates them from an actual sampler? Like what makes it the difference between Ableton Live or Pro Tools and a sampler? And the difference is that with Ableton Live or Pro Tools, you're not really assigning sounds to, to keys on a keyboard, although you could argue that with Ableton Live you can do that. And I would say yes, you can. But uh, especially with Pro Tools and Logic, you really can't just on the track itself. So you can take a loop and you can just like loop it out across the track and it goes across the track for the whole entirety of the song. But that's not really playing it back musically on a keyboard. And that's the big difference. That's what a sampler does. A sampler plays back sounds musically on a keyboard. Now, the, a little bit of the history of the sampler, if we get into, if we go to here and go in here and uh, let's go to um, YouTube. I just want to show you all something here. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna open it up here. But what we're gonna do is we are gonna go to the Mellotron. So the Mellotron here is something I definitely recommend you uh, mess around with uh, if you um, if like go explore what the Mellotron is because the Mellotron is really the kind of grandfather to the sampler and what it was was a tape it basically it was like a, a keyboard looking thing and it had keys uh connected to um uh tape reels and so there's there's some nice videos on here about how to how the mellotron works and i highly recommend that you check them out i mean some of these videos are a little bit longer than what i want to get into right now but i highly recommend that you check out some of these videos and um Uh, and, th and that's basically where the sampling came from. So sampling came from, this is something in the 60s and 70s, people used the Mellotron, and it was just, you know, a, a keyboard that had tape reels connected to each key on it, and it would just play back those sounds. And we're going to be talking about some Mellotron sounds later on in the, in the week. But uh, it's not something I want to get into too, too much right now, but you could really put anything on those sounds, on those, on those keys, on the keyboard, and if you listen to old Beatles uh, songs, for example, like um, Good Morning and stuff like that from the Sgt. Pepper's album, that's all Mellotron uh, sounds and samples there. So really cool stuff. It's, you know, the problem with the Mellotron though is that you couldn't really change out the samples super easily. You couldn't like put your own samples on there if you had a Mellotron uh, without a whole lot of work. So it, it wasn't something super, super easy to use, but uh, it was definitely paving the way for what we, where we are now. Then after the Mellotron um, came the... Uh, uh, my mind just went blank. Mm. Man, pardon my memory here for a second. Well, mm. well, there's the Optagon and stuff like that, but the Fairchild. No, not the fair, not the uh, the Fairlight. There we go, CMI. Oops, not this Fairlight CMI. We have one more step. How do you open up Contact and Pro Tools? Uh, you got to open up an instrument track. Uh, you'll, you'll see me. I'll I'll do it in a second. But here's the Fairlight. The Fairlight is super super cool. Um, and this came from the late 70s, early 80s. And the reason why this is the next step is because this one here is uh, the first digital machine that had samples that you could play back samples with. So you can see like you can see like videos if you do a search on YouTube. Lots of cool stuff with Herbie Hancock and uh, the, uh, the Fairlight CMI. And they just released it again um, not that long ago. Uh, <clears throat> they kind of did a re-release a few years ago of this uh, CMI, Fairlight CMI. But they're like... Super, super expensive. They're like twenty-five thousand or thirty thousand dollars. So they are super, super expensive. But Arturia does make a CMI virtual instrument, which basically is the sounds of the Fairlight, which is super, super cool. 
so I highly recommend checking this one out as well. But it's um, it's it's definitely very limited to compared to what we have today. If you're really going to check it out from Archeria, really what you're going to do is you're going to be buying it just because you want some of the sounds. And if you listen to like uh, Thriller or Herbie Hancock stuff, there's a lot of Fairlight on on like especially Thriller. The opening sounds of that song are the Fairlight, and there's <clears throat> some other stuff in there. If you listen to, um, uh, like I said, Herbie Hancock and artists like possibly the Art of Noise, although there's some confusion for me about the Art of Noise, if they're using a Fairlight or if they were just using um, one of the EMU systems samplers. So if, if you also want a, like an interesting Wikipedia uh, sampler history, has actually the, the Wikipedia page is on a, not the needlework sampler, but the Wikipedia page for the sampler here. And you can see a nice little history of it. Um, <clears throat> you can see here that they got into uh, the Fairlight, the Emu SP12, and the Akai MPC60. A lot of people just think of the sampler as the Akai MPC, and that's like the start of it, but that's not at all the start of it. They weren't even the first ones. What Akai brought to the table was the layout. So what they did was they worked with a guy named Roger Lin, and they were doing, they made the, the layout. Roger Lin made this really cool layout, and you can see a picture of it right here, um, where it has these uh, these uh, 16 pads on there that you can play. And so this made it very, very playable. It had a sequencer built into it, so you could make your um, songs right there inside of the MPC, and you could pretty much do everything. And that's why it got really uh, famous and, and kind of popular is because of the form factor, not because it was the first one to do sampling. So <clears throat> um, some other ones before it was like the uh, Emu SP12. This one here has uh, eight pads, like buttons really, and you had faders for controlling the levels of them and uh, you could play them in different ways. And it also had like a sequencer in it as well, but it wasn't really as much of a, it, it wasn't quite as full featured as the MPC. So <clears throat> this is your SP12. It came out before the MPC. Uh, sounds interesting. It's got an interesting sound, but not much um, sample memory. So a couple things about the sampler. Let's go back over here. Um, samples are stored in RAM, and RAM is what your computer has for its like its 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 memory that it accesses right now. RAM stands for random access memory. When you turn off the power to your computer, your RAM disappears. It's different from your hard drive. The hard drive is where you store all the information that you can like, you know, keep for later. RAM is where you store the information for right now. And so your computer needs uh, RAM in order to work. <clears throat> it also needs a hard drive in order to store things. <clears throat> and But RAM is one of those things, and hard drive space as well, one of those things that they started off really, really low levels of RAM and hard drive space. And they kept getting more and more over time. So nowadays, it's not a big deal to see a computer with 16 gigabytes of RAM or more. That's like pretty standard nowadays. But back in the day when samplers were first being created, those uh, devices did not have much uh, RAM at all. So let's take a look at um, vintage synth. So this is a really great uh, resource for learning about old synthesizers and stuff. It's, I mean, it's a very wonky looking website. I don't love the way it looks, but it works really well. So if we go back and we look at, for example, the Emu SP12, do a search for this. Uh, we're gonna get some advertisements there, but if we look it up right here, boom. We can go in here, we can see some of the things about it. So for example, it was made from 1985 to 1987. Uh, the memory had eight user sounds in there, but you can look here. This is where we can see some of the more information about it. It had 48 kilobytes of memory. So the 48 kilobytes of memory, just something uh, to kind of understand, is that 48 kilobytes of memory, one megabyte is a thousand kilobytes, and one gigabyte is a thousand megabytes. So we're like 48K is really, really low levels of memory. So it could do 1.2 seconds of sampling. And you could expand it up to 192 kilobytes for five seconds of sampling. That's really not much at all. And the reason 
why those old hip hop albums like um, NWA and stuff like that sound the way they do is because of how the sampling worked at that time. Because you only had 1.2 seconds, what these people would do is they would speed up the record when they would sample it. They'd, so they'd sample it fast and then they would pitch it down on certain keys on their sampler uh, to make it sound correct. And that's how they got, like that's how they would kind of get more out of the sampler, more time out of it. Uh, and But when you slowed it down like that, it kind of changed the sound of the sample slightly. Uh, and it just added to the crunchiness. Also, the fact that it was a 27.5 kilohertz uh, sample rate and in 12 bit, bit samples, uh, it, insane. It's just, it's crazy how low, uh, like how like lo-fi these things are. And that's another reason why you have that sound there. If we go look at the um, MPC-60, The MPC-60 came out a little bit later, 1988, uh, and it had 12-bit, 40 uh, kilohertz, and this one had 16 voices, and it had 768 kilobytes, which is 13 seconds, and it was expandable to 1.5 megabytes, which is 26 seconds of sample time. So you could do a lot more with this, um, but you couldn't really sample pianos and instruments and stuff like that with this thing. I mean, you, you could kind of, and when the discs that it came with had some piano samples on it, but they were highly compressed and sampled in a way which would kind of get more out of it. They didn't sound great, but it did work. Um, what the Akai uh, MPC-60 really did for the world was, like I said, the form factor here. Really, really cool stuff. And then later on, you got different samplers. So for example, the Akai, uh, well, there's the Emu sampler. Let's just do a look at that. So for example, you had the Emu Emulator 4, and this is a rack mount unit. It looked like this on the front of it. And they had different versions of it, but um, oh, this doesn't have the, uh, doesn't have the um, about section over here. That's interesting. Well, these things could do, I mean, they were really cool. I mean, I, I, this is one of the ones I almost bought the 4XT, uh, the E64 Ultra. They could do, you could do a lot with them. Let's see, maybe. Two, three, four, ESI. I mean, you could do a lot with them. I don't have the exact numbers here in front of me. And then the one I actually had was the Akai uh, S5000. This is the one that I ended up getting into in the, um, in the late 90s. And this one here, you could expand it up to um, 256 uh, megabytes of RAM. Uh, that it could, you know, you could have a whole bunch of uh, sounds in there for this. This is the S6000, had a removable face, face plate, so you could sit there with it anywhere in the studio. Uh, the one I had was the S5000, it just sat in my rack. And it was pretty good. It, the, the filters and stuff on it were not amazing. Um, I kind of regret not getting into an emu because the filters were better on those. But this one was, you know, it's it, Akai is, really does all the things. And I liked the big screen on it, so that's why I got that one there. Uh, I did get the uh, upgrade memory for 256 megabytes. That cost me like $300. 256 megabytes for $300. That's insane. It was it was crazy. So nowadays with computers, we can do so much more because basically samplers are just kind of computers. They do sound differently. And if you're like a real, if you're really into the sound of things and how, and like, uh, you know, vintage gear and stuff, these old samplers, um, like the MPC 2500, the MPC 2000, like this, uh, they definitely have a sound to them because of the digital to analog converters. So it doesn't sound exactly the same as just running stuff out of, um, out of contact or something like that. And it doesn't, definitely doesn't sound the same uh, as these modern MPCs. <clears throat> but... Um, they, you know, they're basically computers. And so I found it very easy just to do stuff inside a computer finally. And that's why I finally, uh, ultimately I sold my S5000 and I no longer have it. 
Uh, but more recently, I decided to get back into using hardware samplers just because of uh, how it works. It's a little bit different from using it on your computer. So that's why I have the MPC Live. So, um, and there's, there, you know, these different companies are always going forward with this stuff. So, for example, um, uh, Native Instruments just released the Machine Plus, and we can take a look at that later on in the week as well. So that's a little overview about the history of samplers. We, they kind of went into the computer, and now we're kind of coming back out of the computer a little bit. And now it's very hybrid if you're between using the computer and the hardware. So it's, it's actually pretty cool. All right. <clears throat> so... Some more vocabulary, since we've just covered the history of it. Some more vocabulary here. Uh, the sample start is the start point of the sample, and then you have the sample end, which is the end point of the sample. So if I, if I record a sound in there, and I can change where the sound starts and where it stops. The root note is the note that plays the sample at its original recording. So I can play the sample across my whole keyboard, but the root note is the one that plays it at its original pitch. Uh, then I have my key zone. This assigns the sample to specific keys on the keyboard. Uh, with the key zone, you have the low key and you have the high key. So which key plays the lowest part and which key plays the highest part. And again, we're going to go over this in just a minute, showing it to you in contact. Then you have velocity zones, which assigns the sample to specific velocities, how hard or soft I hit the key. Uh, for this, if I'm assigning things to different zones, this all has to do with multi-sampling. Multi-sampling enables multiple samples to be used within one instrument. And it's used to help sampled acoustic instruments sound more natural. That's the main thing, but it's also used so you can just put different types of samples onto your playable keyboard. <clears throat> Groups allow you to adjust parameters of multiple samples all at the same time. Then you have things like tuning, uh, which adjusts the pitch or speed of the sample in semitones, the loop, you can set a loop point so it repeats the sample or a portion of it. And then with the loop, you have the loop start and the loop end as well. Okay, so we're going to go over here into Pro Tools. And I've got, here I've got contact. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn off the, uh, the browser over here on the left-hand side. We don't need to see that. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go into my hard drive. And I'm going to grab some samples out of here. So I got here my sample libraries, and in here I've got some. Uh, let's grab sample phonics. I'm a big fan of sample phonics stuff. And in here, pajama beats. Uh, this is um, some good stuff here. And in here, we'll go into electronic beats. And I'm just going to grab something over here. Let's grab King Beat. I'm just gonna grab this and drag it into contact. So I drag it and I let go. And that's as easy as it is to bring a sample in here. So if I hit play on this, great, so y'all can hear that. Okay, so you'll notice that when I hit keys on my keyboard, let me just make sure that the keyboard is looking good here. Yeah, pretty good. Okay, cool. So you can see that really well. Awesome. So here's here's what it looks like in contact. And there's a, a few things on the front here. We don't really need to talk about this too much right now. But uh, what we really is important here is that you have this wrench button over here. And this, gonna, this is going to get us into the guts of our contact instrument here. So I click on this, and now what happens is I can see a few things inside of contact here. Where I want to go to is my mapping editor, and this is going to show me all the stuff we just talked about. So you can see across the bottom here, there's a keyboard, and above the keyboard there's this yellow box. And if I play notes on my keyboard here, you can see there's a red line that shows up. And I can play this. Okay, so I can play that, but I can also play it on different keys on my keyboard. And this yellow box is showing me where, what all keys on my keyboard this sample is attached to. So if I go up or down, watch what happens to the sound. Okay, we got that sound there. 
and you can see my little red box, my little red dot here, is showing me where I'm playing keys on my keyboard. And notice what's happening. As I go higher on the keyboard, it's getting faster and it's going up in pitch. Now this is not a special effect. This up in pitch, faster thing is not a special effect. If I go down on the keyboard, Right, as I go down on the keyboard, it gets slower and lower in pitch. And this has to do with physics and just the physics of sound. What you learned about in Mod 1 applies here as well. So we've got our, uh, when the waveform gets longer, the pitch goes down. And basically when it gets longer, what does that mean? It means it's getting slower. If I slow it down, that waveform is going to stretch out and it's going to make it go down in pitch. But it's also getting slower. So this is a really interesting thing about sampling is that when you are sampling, you can think about things as higher or lower, but you can also think about things as faster or slower. When I go up in pitch, it's getting faster. When I go down in pitch, it's getting slower. So when you're talking about a beat loop or something like that, like this here, if I have it at this tempo right here, right, that works fine. Right? But I could also say, okay, my tempo is faster, so I can play it at a higher pitch. Right? So I have that right there. So I'm playing it on different keys on my keyboard, depending on how fast or slow my song is that I'm playing it with. Okay? Now this, this one here is... Which one was this? This was uh, 80 BPM. So what I'm going to do in here is I'm just going to go in here to my track. I'm going to put a click track in here. <clears throat> That's my click track. And we're going to go ahead and loop. Uh, let's, make a, let's make a four bar loop here. And we're going to slow it down to 80 BPMs. If I play it, right, you can hear it's at the right tempo there. So what I can do is I can go ahead and play that in. So I have that. Hey, what happened? Pro Tools. There we go. Okay, so I have this here. <clears throat> and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and quantize these real quick. I can highlight them and hit Option 0. Quantize to the 16th note is fine. Boom. And... Turn that off so we're not hearing it every time. I'm also going to make these stretch out to here, stretch it out to here, boom, boom, cool. And I'm going to make them both a bit louder in velocity, all the way up to the full velocity. Close this window out, cool. So now we hit go. All right, so we've got that note. I just played that note in, but watch what happens. If I change my tempo, let's change my tempo to 100. You'll see that the notes on the MIDI here are still exactly the same. They still last the same amount. If I go in here and I go to my MIDI window, they're still, each one is two bars long. But listen to what happens to our sound. It doesn't line up any longer. And this is a big problem with samples and sampling, is that you have to know your tempo of your song, and you also have to know uh, the tempo of the sample, and you have to be able to put them together. N not that you have to know the tempo of the sample, but you have to at least listen to the tempo of the sample and, and identify, okay, it's faster or slower or whatever. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go in here, and I'm gonna put this up 
a couple of uh, BPMs, a couple of um, uh, notes. Cool. And it's, it's pretty good. I'm gonna put it down one half step. Okay, so you can hear it's actually kind of between these two notes somewhere. It's not exactly right here. And the reason why this is, is because <clears throat> when I'm going up by semitones, there's a whole bunch of um, <clears throat> there's a whole bunch of information in between each semitone on your keyboard. And so when I'm going at 100 BPMs, well, this um, sample, if I put it up this X amount of semitones, in this case it's uh, one, two, three, four semitones. When I put it up four semitones, uh, then it's it's not going to go up. It's not 100. Uh, it's not a, it's not actually from it's not 20 BPMs. It's like a different thing and Nico says is there a ratio between pitch and tempo and there absolutely is but that's math that I don't know I always just earball it by ear but there is a ratio let's go see what the internet says about this ratio um, pitch to time ratio for samples um, Let's see, whoa. Okay, this is like a whole thing. The answer is yes, there is a ratio, but I actually haven't. Yeah, I just, I just kind of guessed, but it's actually super easy and I've always just done it by ear. So for example, what I would do is if it didn't sound right, let's, let's put this at, uh, let's put our tempo at a slightly different tempo. Let's put it at uh, 105. And we'll go back to our original here. I'm gonna pitch it down. So here's what it sounds like originally. And you can hear it's faster, right? So what I would do is I'd say, okay, that's faster. I don't know exactly, hey, what's up, Kat? How you doing? I don't know exactly how much faster it is, but I know it's faster. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go up here and I'm gonna put it right here. Okay, we can hear it's almost there, but it's not quite fast enough, so I'll just go up one more. Okay, now we can hear that my note is a little bit too fast. So what I would do in this case is if I don't need to, if I'm not exactly trying to get my tempo to fit the pitch, if I can actually adjust my tempo a little bit or, or the sample to fit it, if I can come back with my sample, what I can do is I can now back this off a little bit because I've just been doing you know five. So let's go to 103, and I would just listen to it. Okay, so we can hear it's a, actually it's a little bit. I went the wrong direction. And there we go. That's pretty good. So you can see that by going to 107, it kind of worked a little bit better. Let's try 108 and see what that sounds like. Yeah, that's a little bit the wrong direction here. So let's try 106. And you just kind of like mess around with it. Because a lot of the times uh, back in the day when I was when I was working with samples mostly, because I don't do it like this anymore. This is really old school the way I'm showing you. This is like 90s type of stuff. And back in the 90s, you didn't really know the exact tempo of songs like we do today. We didn't know the exact tempo of samples and stuff like that because people weren't really making sample libraries the way they are today. If you wanted to sample something, you grabbed a song and you sampled it or you sampled like, you know, yourself making a beat or something like that. You didn't have all these libraries for like, you know, $10, $20 that had a whole bunch of loops and stuff in them like we do now. Sampling um, content creators weren't really uh, as much of a thing as they are now. Hey, what's up, Handel? How you doing? Um, so it's we live in a very different world from when I was actually doing this professionally, like like when I was really doing this uh, back in the '90s. So nowadays, I just throw this into Ableton Live and I just go with it. And and I'll show you that uh, we're gonna get into that more tomorrow, how to work with that stuff. But uh, the the process isn't nearly as 
as involved as it as it used to be. And I'm showing this kind of for two reasons. One is because I think it's really interesting to know this stuff and there's a lot of really cool things you can do with samples and samplers and old school sampling um, that's, that's different from how you would maybe do it in Ableton Live or Pro Tools. So if I was to do the same thing in Pro Tools, uh, here's what I would do. I would just make an audio track, a stereo audio track, and I would drag the same sample what sample was it? King Beat 01. Okay, so I would just find the same sample. King Beat 01, right here, this one, and I would drag it into Pro Tools. If I just wanted to get the sample loop going, I would drag this into Pro Tools, and then, uh, here, let's put this at 80. Mm, wait, hold on, let's take it out. Let's put it at 80 to start with. And I would just drag it into Pro Tools like this. And you can see over here, because my uh, track is in elastic audio mode and I have ticks turned on for this track, and this is all stuff we talked about a long time ago. So now if I listen to this one here, right, it's gonna work fine. If I speed up my tempo now, watch what happens. It's, it works perfectly, and if I speed it up even more, right, I don't have to think about it. So I don't, I don't do stuff with the sampler the way that I would, ha would have had to in the 90s. I'm super, like I already struggled with that for 10 years, uh, and there's no reason to co go back to that for me. But that's not the only reason to use samples and stuff. So we're gonna, you know, I'm just kind of showing you an overview of stuff. Now, one thing you'll notice though, is that if I play these together, oops, let's play them together here. Whoops, hold on, I gotta change this back to the right key. All right, that sounds fine. But if I want to change this to 100 BPMs, I have to pitch this up. What do we pitch it up to an E, right? Something like that. So now I'm going to play it. It's going to be a little bit off, but but I want you to listen. I'm going to solo this one here first, and I'm going to play this one. Or I'm going to solo this one here. So I changed to 100. <clears throat> exactly, Nico. You're, you're stealing my fire there, buddy. Yeah, you're stealing my thunder. So I got that one, but listen to this one. See how I pitched it up? Right? It pitched it up and it's a little bit off. But with the modern uh, DAWs, it, this, is what elastic, this is why elastic audio is so cool or warping, stuff like that, is because it doesn't have to pitch it anymore. It can keep it at the same pitch. So essentially what's happened is with, with real samples, it, with real sampling, and we're using, um, uh, we're using the, basically physics to control our sound, then we're restrained by the laws of physics. So you go up, you go down, it's gonna go up in pitch, it's gonna go down in pitch, it's gonna get faster and slower. Pitch and time are connected together. But what Elastic Audio does in warping, it disconnects pitch and time. It disconnects pitch from time. So now you've got this uh, system where we don't have to worry about the pitch or the, or the timing, you just throw it in there and it just works. Now if I wanted to uh, mess around with my pitch and my timing, what I can do, if I wanted my pitch to control my time with Pro Tools here, what I can do is I can take it out of rhythmic mode and put it into very speed mode. And very speed, remember, that's like a record player. So now, if I go back to 80 BPMs, there's our original tempo and our original pitch. And if I change this to uh, 100, now listen to the pitch. It sounds like our sample over here. All right, they sound the same. And that's what very speed does. Very speed essentially makes it sound like you did it in a sampler or a record player or something like that. 
So it's, it's great for kind of recreating this breakbeat sound and kind of like treating beat loops and stuff like they would, would have been with a sampler. But um, it, remember, it is gonna change the pitch. So if you have something that's pitched in there, like a pitched piano line or something like that, you're gonna have to figure out how that reacts with the pitch of your song. There's a whole bunch of music theory and stuff involved in this if you wanna get, go there. But realistically, when I was in uh, college and I was working with uh, various people, I had a lot of friends who, and I've known a lot of people over the years, who don't know anything about music theory. They just use their ears. They would just like sit there and listen to it. Oh, okay, good, that sounds cool. I'm gonna do it like that. They don't even know what note they're playing. They don't know anything about that stuff. They're just like, this is the note that sounds good. I'm gonna play that note. So you don't have to know music theory, although it does make life a little bit more difficult for you. All right, so let's go back in over to here and let's talk about sample start and sample end. Okay, so we have this in here. I'm gonna go ahead and open my contact here. So the sample start and sample end is in our wave editor. The wave editor is this window right here. So I'm gonna click on this. I'm gonna close down my mapping editor. I'm also gonna do one thing here with this. I'm gonna go down here. I'm gonna go ahead and change this release to make it a lower release time. There we go. So now, if I play this, we can see you can see the playhead is scrolling through my sample, so I can see actually where my sample is. So I can adjust my start flag right here, and one more time, this is in the wave editor in contact, and I can adjust my start point here. And I could start right here. I could zoom in. See that? I can zoom in, I can see what's going on. Now what I could do is I could say, I like that, so I'm gonna play that in here. So instead of using this right here, I'm gonna go ahead and hit the, sorry, let's put that back. Let's mute this and put this back to 80 BPMs. Okay, so. Cool. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to turn on my MIDI merge. That's what's not on. There we go. Cool. So, so I got this one here. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to grab these two bars here. Now, you'll notice that a couple things. One, this is where things start to get interesting and why it's fun to use samples in a sampler instead of just taking the beat loop and looping it out. And this is, I, I always do this a lot. And again, I'm gonna show you this in Ableton Live later because Ableton Live makes this super easy to do all this stuff. But um, in here, I've got this one here and let's listen to it. Let's go ahead and quantize it first. All right, that sounds pretty cool, but let's go ahead and make these connected so they all connect together. And this is where the event operation starts to get really useful, especially when you're dealing with samples and things like this, because playing this super connected with the one note, just triggering the one note over and over again, would be a little bit uh, tricky. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in here, I'm gonna go to uh, change duration, and we're gonna set all, oh, we're gonna set legato to uh, no gap, and we're just gonna put this to zero right here. I'm gonna hit apply, and what's gonna happen is these notes here are not gonna have these gaps between them. Boom, so now we can see that there. So listen to that. Here, let's do a before and after. Cool, so here's before. Right? Now, you might say, Tony, this first one sounds pretty cool, actually, and I would agree. I think it sounds pretty neat, but if it's not what we want, it's good to understand how we can have control over it so we can set that up. And we could also change this, like check this out. We can set 
to change continuously like this from 100% to uh, let's say 75%. And what that's going to do is it's going to make gaps appear over time. Hit apply. So you see how this, as we go through it, it gets to be more bigger and bigger gaps. Here, let's listen to this. Right, which is pretty cool sound. Okay, so you can, when you're dealing with MIDI, you can use all these cool tricks to mess with it. And that's why it's nice to have stuff in MIDI uh, and in audio. So to know, to, know, to know how to use both worlds. So if I just wanted this beat loop to just kind of go, oops. If I just wanted this beat loop to kind of go, uh, then I might use just, I would just drag it into Pro Tools and just go. But if I want this beat loop to do different stuff, I would use it how I'm utilizing it. Now, so let's go ahead and let's do this again. I'm gonna do another another recording. Let that go through two bars. Something like that. Let's just hear what that sounds like. I'm gonna go ahead and quantize that. It's gonna sound really weird though, because Okay. Now with these here, one thing you should notice, I'm going to go ahead and pitch these up. So I'm doing octaves. Okay. I'm going to play these as a long note here for you real quick. Let's just go ahead and stretch this out. And I want you to I want you to notice something here with this stuff. And here we're gonna go like this. And I'll put my sample start time back to where it was because I want you to hear this a little bit more clearly. And notice I'm gonna put the sample start time back. So let's listen to this. Now I don't know if, if you if you're noticing what's happening here, but what's happening is it's playing these exactly in the right tempo because we're using octaves. I'm using octaves for this stuff. So if I go up an octave, it's exactly twice as fast, and if I go down an octave, it's exactly twice as slow. And if you um, if you think about what you learned in mod one, you're going to understand why this happens like this. So the reason why it's happening is because an uh, an octave doubles the frequency. An octave up doubles the frequency, an octave down halves the frequency. So if we go double the frequency, we're going twice as fast, which is an octave up, and half the frequency is uh, twice as slow, and um, it uh, halves the frequency. So it's, it's, it's all the stuff you learned in mod one just kind of applied to this very specific thing here. All right, so let's, talk, let's take a look at our sample endpoint. So here we have this. So if I wanted to, I could just take this and just do this. Right, so I can just go in here. So I could record something like that. that there. Let's go ahead and quantize this. <clears throat> cool. That sounds pretty good. And I can now duplicate that or whatever I want to do with that. Okay. So I can do that kind of stuff there. Now what I can also do though, oh, let's go back and talk about our mapping editor over here. Let's take a look at these 
at the notes here. So we have the sample start and the sample end and our root note. Now, the root note in contact is this yellow note right here. This is our root note right here. So if I play, you can see it's, it's on the same note here. If I go up, see how it's, it's sounding different? Right, but the root note is the one that plays it back at its original tempo. So what I can do is I can go over here and I can take this and drag it over and drag this one over as well. Now when I play other keys on my keyboard, it's not going to play anything because our key zone is only on this one key. The sample zone is just on that one key there. So we have the key zone assigns the sample to specific keys. We have the low key and the high key. So if I go back here, into contact. Let's say I wanted this sample to be a couple different keys. Maybe I just want it to be these keys. Right? But if I play other notes, it's not going to play. It's just in that one key zone right there. I can just assi I can just assign it to one key here. But what I can do is I can move my root note around. If I move my root note up one octave, the note I'm playing is an octave down. And if I move my note, my root note down one octave, the note I'm playing is an octave up. So let's say I want to chop up the sample. And chopping up a sample is lingo for I'm going to cut the sample up into pieces and have different pieces on my different notes. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go in here, I'm going to edit. Uh, let's duplicate the zone. Boom, I just duplicated it. I'm just going to take it and drag it over here. So now I have two zones, two different key samples, and they both sound exactly the same. The reason why they sound exactly the same is because, hold on, let me uh, close. Here we go, select zone via MIDI. So if I click on this one, it's going to play this one here. You can see the root note is here. If I play this one, the root note is right here. So the root note, if I move it, and I can move this by clicking and dragging. The root note, uh, but if I put it right under it, the root note stays the same. So even though it's on two different pitches on my key, keys on my keyboard, it's the same pitch. It sounds the same as the same tempo. But what I'm going to do with this one here is I'm going to go to my wave editor and I'm going to change this. I'm going to adjust this. So now when I flip back and forth between these, up here, if I hit my C, it's this sample, and if I hit the D, it's that sample. And now we can start playing it and making it a little bit more interesting here. So I'm going to go ahead and hit record in Pro Tools. Right, so you can hear it's a little bit hard to play just because I don't have a lot of practice doing this these days because uh, I don't really play stuff. I mean, I do play stuff in, but then what I do is I fix it like this. Boom. Move that there like that. Like that. Take this. And I'm going to go ahead and make it all legato there. Change the duration. Set gap to zero. Hit apply. Cool, right? Now I can go in even, and I can edit it even more. And I can say, all right, well, I can maybe change, oops, just change this one here. Hey. Don't do that, there we go. I 
And I can adjust little things like this here to kind of if I wanted to. And you can hear how it changes the sound up a little bit. But that's pretty cool because now I've got that sample, this, the, all, the, all the parts of it are kind of coming together and it gives it a different vibe from if I was just going to play all these like separately. So I can make it play just the... just the kick and the snare part. Or the whole loop. Okay. <clears throat> so that's from using our, our key zones and our root note, all that stuff we just talked about here a second ago. So all this stuff here, the key zone, low key, high key, all that stuff there. Now, if I wanted to put, let's say, um, I wanted to have a bass sound in here. Let's go ahead and grab some sounds from here. Uh, let's see here. What's in the guitars section? I think, I feel like these are maybe loops. Yeah, here, let's grab some individual notes here. Let's see. Mm -mm 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 -mm. I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna go and grab from here. Let's do um, sample magic because they have more individual sounds in here. Analog house, drum hits, bass, loops. These are all loops, drum loops, chord loops. Actually here, let's, let's grab a chord loop here. Okay, so I'm gonna grab that one there. I'm gonna drag that one in. And I'm gonna go ahead and X this out here. I'm gonna just, yeah, nope, do not save. Actually, cancel. Did I? Oh, I already got rid of it. Okay, never mind. So here, we'll do this and save changes. No, do not save the changes. So I have this one down here, this loop. Okay, so we have that there. And what we're gonna do here is, let's drag another sample in here. We're going to drag a couple samples in here. We're going to drag this one. And I just again, I just drag and drop it in. I hit the the, uh, the wrench, and we're going to go to our mapping editor. And I'm going to have it so this one here is on certain notes. On these notes over here, we're going to go from. Uh, let's go over one octave, and I'm going to. Go ahead and put this kind of in the middle here. What does it say? It says it's uh, the key of G. So we can see on my screen here, the sample is made for G. So I'm gonna put it on G. Put your root note to whatever your sample says. And again, keep in mind these days, uh, a lot of the sample libraries that we have will put the, put the information into the sample. And that wasn't always the case. You'd usually have to figure stuff out by yourself. But nowadays we've got it all set there. So our root says here G3, and we've got it set here. We can see if I change that, it's the key of G. I'm going to go to my wave editor and I'm going to go ahead and cut this down so my sample start and end points are right here. So if I hit play on, if I hit play on my notes, I can now play it. So let's put another one in here that's also in the key of G. If we have one, we have one, maybe. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. That was probably very loud. Sorry about that, y'all. I'm just listening to some of these here real quick. Okay, so there's a cool sound. So I'm gonna just take this and drag it in. When I already have a sample uh, a instrument here, 
I can just put it right here on the instrument wherever I want it to be. So I'm just going to put it there. And if we look at this now, this is my root note. So I'm going to move that. this across and what I'm going to do here and you got okay that's okay-ish I, I always have troubles with chords that are like you know set up like this but but now I can play two different notes. If you look here on my keyboard, I have two different samples going on here. And I can take the second sample here, I can adjust. Let's adjust the start and end points here just to grab one of these little parts. I kind of like that one better. I can adjust this here to start any place I want. And now I've just kind of adjusted that sample there. Who is this person? Wow, okay. I don't know who you are, but you just got banned. Sorry, I was like zoomed in. I didn't see the person going nuts over there. All right, so. So we could put that in there. Now we've set that up there. Go ahead and hit play over here. So you can hear that sound in there um, and how we just sampled that and cut it up like that. So that's an example of using uh, your key zones and like, uh, you know, low point and high point like that. <clears throat> cool. Where's the, uh, how did I get rid of it by accident here? Let's All right. Cool, and that's, so what this is, is this multi-sampling right here in our notes. This is an example of multi-sampling. We're using multiple samples within one instrument. Now, this is normally used to be, to help a sampled acoustic instruments sound more natural, but um, really what's happening here is, uh, in this case, I'm just using it to kind of put different samples together. So you can use it to make stuff sound more natural, or you can just use it to create your own sample libraries on your keyboard there. Um, all right, so let's do this. Let's take a little break, and then we're going to come back and talk about um, loop, looping and stuff like that, and talk about that real quick, all right?